Okay. All right, we will call the meeting to order at 4.30. Okay, we will proceed to roll call vote. Susan? Trustee Anderson? Here. Trustee Crane? Here. Trustee Wigand? Here. Trustee Pearson? Here. Trustee Murphy? Trustee Ursoilu? Here. Trustee Barto? Here. Okay, adoption of the agenda. So moved. I'll second. Okay. Moved by um, Trustee Crane, seconded by Barto. Roll call vote, please. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Commun uh, community input on uh, closed session items only? Seeing that there's none? None. All right. We will now move to closed session. The items are 4A, conference with labor negotiator, 4B, public employee discipline dismissal release employment, and 4C, public employee discipline release dismissal um, employment 202301HR. And we will return to open session at 6 p.m. Okay, we will call our meeting to order. Um, welcome to our school board meeting. Um, we had some items to um, that we discussed in closed session. Um, the motion is made and seconded that the Board of Education approve the resignation agreement and general release for 202301HR, and the vote was 7-0. And we will now um, have our moment of reflection and Pledge of Allegiance led by Fernando. Please stand, oh sorry, place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, now we'll move to adoption of the minutes. So moved. Do have a second? Second. Sec okay. Moved by Trustee Wagon, seconded by Trustee Barto. Roll call vote. Sorry. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursorlu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay. Next, we will um, introduce staff. We have a new staff person. Um, good evening, uh, Board President Board and uh, Superintendent Smith. It's my pleasure tonight to announce uh, Mr. Keith Carmona, who is our new um, Director of Secondary Teaching and Learning. And Keith Carmona is right here in the front row, if you'd wave. He's in a sea of students and individuals over there. Uh, but Keith Carmona um, comes to us from the Placenta Yorba Linda School District uh, and is celebrating his 20th year in education. And so we're very pleased to have Keith come aboard. He rounds out our secondary team. Um, I serve as our assistant superintendent of secondary education. We have our administrative director, um, Dr. Mike Shaka, who also serves on our team, and then Keith Carmona. So welcome. Appreciate having you, and thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Um, and now we will do our recognitions. Um, first, we'll start with our recognition of fall athletic sports champions. Um, if I can call up Dr. Shaka, please. Thank you. President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, and all of our guests who are joining us today. It is my pleasure to congratulate the Newport Harbor High School boys water polo team for yet another CIF Southern Section Open Division Championship and National Championship. The success that Coach Sinclair has continued to build at Newport Harbor is unquestionable. The dedication shown by the, uh, the coaching staff, parents, and most importantly, the students have elevated this program to the highest of levels. And of course, this would not be possible with the continued support 
of both district and site leadership at Newport Harbor High School and Principal Sean Bolton. Sean would like to share some details about Newport Harbor water polo. So without any further delay, Sean. Trustee Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, and distinguished guests, thank you for honoring our water polo team. This is the second championship in two years, so it's back to back. It's the first time that they've gone back to back since 1983-1984. It's the 14th CIF championship in school history to be this elite in this sport in California. The dedication that these young men give day in and day out in the pool and in the classroom is unprecedented and it's unparalleled. All of them also have close to a 4.0, if not above a 4.0 GPA. There's also a valedictorian amongst this team like there was last year. So I could go on and on and on. But as Dr. Shaka mentioned, it takes all of us from the board level to the superintendent level. Dr. Smith, you were at the final again this year and also I can't say enough about transportation, Shelly Humphreys in transportation. It was a hot day for the finals, the semi and the final at the Irvine Aquatic Center. The bus drivers show up on time, they transport our students, they wait for the matches, they transport them back. And then again, it's just an integral part of what happens here from the board to the superintendent, to the different divisions. And also Coach Sinclair is a teacher at Newport Harbor High School, a graduate of Newport Harbor High School. And of course, the young men that represent all our cherished values at Newport Harbor, the Newport Harbor High School water polo team. So I present to you the 2022-2023 Newport Harbor High School CIF Open Division Championship team. Thank you guys. Um, Shaka, Fulton, obviously said a lot and I don't want to overstep on my boss here, but <laughs> how do you go from winning last year uh, into this year? Well, we went back to back. Last year we had a valedictorian. We actually have two valedictorians, uh, Owen Bartlett and uh, Finn Lesseur. So um, an amazing group, an amazing season, and uh, thank you guys for your support. I think the leadership starts here, trickles down to the on campus. Um, and I think really importantly is, is the parents. Uh, it's an amazing group of parents and the way they support Myself, the school, this community, and this district is uh, second to none. So I uh, want to give them a quick shout out as well. So here we go. We're going to get these boys over here and get the show on the road. So Alex Altshuter, shoulder. Sorry, Bean. <laughs> Gavin Appledorn. <laughs> Owen Bartlett. Quinn Bartlett, Peter Castillo, Finn Gentz, Nick Kennedy, Finn Lesseur, Ben Lathy, <laughs> Cooper Mathisrud, <laughs> Gavin Netherton, <laughs> Shane Santoni, <laughs> Tyler Slutsky, <laughs> Trent Smith. Owen Tift, Will Vondre, and Jack Wright. CIF champs.
Great job. And next up, we have recognition of secondary education student award winners. Dr. Shaka. You know, I remember all those Ensign boys when they were about this tall. So. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, in the spirit of continued recogni uh, recognition for amazing students, I'd like to continue our recognition. And it is my pleasure to introduce two outstanding students from Newport Harbor. I'm not sure if Ryan Honoree or Mar Joyce are here. Are you guys with us today? I, I'm not sure if they're able to make it, but I do want to acknowledge them for their uh, their outstanding accomplishments. So first, we have uh, uh, two Newport Harbor High School students competed in both state and national STEM competitions. Our students did an outstanding job demonstrating their knowledge and skills related to science, technology, engineering, and math. Two students in particular truly excelled, Ryan Honoree and Mar Joyce, uh, Phoebe De Quiros. So first, Ryan received top honors for his award-winning application, Sensory AI, and his company is going to host a panel discussion on global showcase called the Future of Artificial Intelligence-Driven Environmental Solutions at the UNESCO conference in Paris. Ryan has already accomplished all of this and is only a ninth grader, so please join me in congratulating Ryan. Wow. And next we have Mar Joyce. Mar Joyce is certainly a name that we all want to rem remember. According to her teacher, Mr. Ballone, she is going to rule the world someday. <laughs> Mar Joyce was recognized for her award-winning application, Impact, which is an application designed to improve youth awareness of global and world events. Her Impact app was a winner, winner of the Congressional App Challenge. So again, congratulations to Mar Joyce. Dr. Bolton's, Dr. Bolton's coming up. Um, well, I guess I'd like to thank uh, Newport Harbor for obviously supporting me all throughout the way and my parents for also supporting me all throughout the way and yeah, I've always felt like it was, I was always supported for everything that I was going to do. And I was never afraid of like starting or thinking of new ideas. So yeah, thank you so much. Next, we have our recognition of Newport Mesa Unified School District's 2023 Employee Excellent Award recipients. Good evening, President Barto, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, and cabinet guests. I am Annette Franco, the public relations officer for our school district, and I am here today with a few of my colleagues so that we can recognize our 2023 Employee Excellence Award winners. Some of you may recall this program as the Superstar Awards. Um, we had more than 200 nominations from parents, students, community members, and along with directors and administrative directors, we reviewed the nominations and selected the top nine for awards tonight. To be recognized for going above and beyond for supporting each other and our students, and I think you'll agree once you hear a little bit more about our nine recipients. So, to present our first one, we have Whittier Principal Randy Lempert. Yay. Good evening, Team Newport Mesa. I want to bring up um, our MVP at Whittier. I want to bring up Alfonso Bravo. So Alfonso is our school community facilitator, and he really knows how to pull a community together. 
He's an organizer. He's a connector. Alfonso connects our students, our families, and our school staff together to support, <laughs> there he is, the needs of our children. And he always remains cool, calm, and collected. Nice. Um, I consider him an amazing teammate to our administration, to our teachers and our families. He really provides a positive experiences for our children. He has a special heart for our children that are overcoming adversity, and he does it with such warmth and with always a smile. He is commended by families for being a listener. Um, he provides them with resources to truly empower our community. Um, Alfonso, he is really builds our community up. He makes them confident, and he really allows them to be successful at Whittier and in our community. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to our team here my MVP, Alfonso Bravo. Good evening, uh, Madam President, trustees, Dr. Smith, members of the cabinet, and our guests. My name is Aaron Peralta, and I'm principal at Victoria Elementary. And my superstar here is Miss Miss Kim Barone. Miss Barone, can, where, where can, should we get her up here? Miss Barone. Uh -huh. Ms. Barone is known throughout our school community for meeting every student where they're at, whether they need extra time and support or whether they are at or above grade level. She tailors her instruction to challenge and support each student to do their very best. As you can imagine, as an elementary teacher, um, reading and literacy is a deep passion of hers, and she instills this in her students. In fact, through the course of the year, she raises funds so that each um, of her students have a little collection of books that they take home that is tailored to his or her interests. And then, always teaching good manners, um, she has the class write thank you letters to those wonderful donors. And of course, an avid writer herself, Miss Barone sends each student a handwritten letter each month recognizing their accomplishments, whether great or small, and expressing those words of encouragement. Whether writing grant proposals for field trips and programming, serving as the representative for Victoria's after school Spanish program, or volunteering for PTA events, Ms. Barone always goes above and beyond for her students. You will not find a greater advocate for kids. Thank you for all you do, Kim and congratulations. Mm. Okay. You, this is a balancing act. <laughs> there we go. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is my um, proud privilege to be able to step in for Dr. Potnis tonight, who is at a CIF event and could not be present, to celebrate Mr. Steve Moreno, our head cross country and track and field coach at Costa Mesa High School. If, is he in the room? If he could step on up. The uh, head coach for the cross country and track and field teams, Steve Moreno, often reminds his athletes, you become what you repeatedly do. 
Moreno inspires his students in a positive, respectful manner, fully embracing the do as I do approach. Before every practice, he shares a quote aimed at encouraging everyone to have their best day, whether in the classroom, on the field, or at home. He then follows up with students daily to ensure they have the resources they need academically, emotionally, and financially to succeed. Moreno has helped his students obtain school supplies, athletic equipment, even prom <laughs> tickets. He volunteers his time during the summer to coach his athletes and year round to raise funds for his team. Moreno's students rely on him for motivation, encouragement, and he is an exceptional role model who inspires future leaders and athletes. Thank you so much. Miss Carrie Torres, I believe you have another recognition. Back to back. I wasn't sure. That's okay. We're trying to get your steps in. Perfect. <laughs> well, well, well. It is my pleasure to bring up Dr. Dave Martinez, who I actually have the pleasure of supervising and working with. So, Dr. Martinez, our distinguished uh, principal. <laughs> principal of Early College High School. Um, the face of Early College High School clearly belongs to Dr. Dave Martinez. Every morning he is stationed in front of the school to personally welcome his students to another great day of learning. He makes students and families feel valued by maintaining continuous communication to ensure that everyone is well aware of school happenings and community and academic resources. Every month, Dr. Martinez hosts interactive virtual chats, sometimes inviting guidance counselors to give brief presentations so that families feel prepared for what to expect as their students move forward in school and life. Even though early college offers a more college preparatory approach to school, he continues to provide support and love to all of his students. He is dedicated to all of the work that he continues to do to make sure that his students get to college. And so it is such a pleasure to see you work every day and be able to really advocate for your students and give them an opportunity that they would not otherwise have. Congratulations, Dr. Martinez. Good evening, I'm Kathleen Leary. I'm the Director of Early and Expanded Learning and I'm very excited to call up Yesenia Rosales. Would you please come up, Yesenia? began working for Newport Mesa in um, 2007 as an instructional assistant in our after school programs. And in 2016, she began as a lead instructional assistant. And she exemplifies excellence in the expectations she sets for herself and her team. As a lead, she is a reflective leader who is constantly finding ways to improve our systems, communication, and relationships. The school year, um, this school year, there have been many, many changes with our after school program, Project Kids Connect, and a very short amount of time. But Yesenia, in her normal, freegoing way, took her new responsibilities and challenges 
with a cheerful demeanor and a lot of flexibility. With nearly 250 students on campus after school at College Park, just a little um, point of context, we had 85 students last year at College Park and we wow. grew to 250. And she took it with a grin on her face. She has, she has demonstrated a growth mindset and faces challenges as opportunities to serve the students at College Park. She advocates for the specific needs of students. She is trusted and respected by staff, families, because she carefully listens and makes thoughtful decisions. Yesenia knows how to bring people together to build a strong community. Thank you for everything. Good evening, President Anderson, trustees, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, and guests. My name is Gabe Del Real. I'm the principal at Harborview Elementary, and I have the honor of joining you this evening to recognize Claudia Padilla, behavioral interventionist from Harborview Elementary. Is Claudia here? You're hiding from us. Okay. <laughs> As educators, we are all in the extraordinary position of being able to witness positive changes in the lives of our students. As is often the case, these positive changes occur incrementally over time as a result of myriad influences in students' lives. However, occasionally an individual works with a student and we see a monumental positive shift. In these instances, there is nothing incremental or subtle. Claudia Padilla is one such indiv individual. In her work with students, she is able to elicit substantial positive change. When Claudia works with students, their entire affect changes. Claudia recognizes when a student is successful and knows how to blend into the background, allowing the student to take center stage. She's also able to use her powerful perception to recognize when students are feeling overwhelmed, frustrated, distracted or irritable. She knows how to spot the earliest signs of these feelings and she knows how to intervene graciously. Claudia seems to possess an innate ability to read the situation and determine just the right strategy to help the student. Whether it's taking a walk outside the classroom, talking or using a calming strategy, Claudia provides a level of support that helps students visualize and achieve their best self both in the classroom and on the playground. Please join me in congratulating Harborview Behavioral Interventionist, Claudia Padilla. Good evening. My name is Jeff Perry and I'm the assistant principal at Corona Del Mar Middle School. And I wanna thank you for this opportunity to bring up and honor one of my special education teachers, Melissa Alt. <laughs> Melissa is dedicated to ensuring every student is set up for success. She inspires a love of learning, not only in her students, but also in her colleagues, with creative hands-on lessons and an infectious joy. Rather than just explaining a concept, she actively involves students as she did when she was teaching them about assembly lines by lining her class up and giving each student a task toward creating a finished product. And when things do not go according to plan, Melissa remains unflappable. 
She is known for saying, that's a tomorrow problem. <laughs> <laughs> she treats students with kindness and respect, making everyone feel equally valued. That care for others extends beyond her classroom. When students transition out of her class and into more specialized programs, Melissa continues to check on students' progress. She is a shining example of the whole child support in which Newport Mesa is committed. Melissa, congratulations. have two more award recipients and unfortunately uh, Principal Cheryl Beck from East Bluff could not be here this evening but I believe Diana Nichols our next award recipient is here <laughs> so I'm probably not going to do this as much justice as your amazing principal would but uh, part of your nomination included this this information there's a phrase that says reading is fundamental and librarian Diana Nichols truly excels at putting the fun in fundamental. She transforms the East Buff Library into a new world based on the themes of her lessons. For example, to encourage students to, new, to read new books, she created an exciting cafe that invites students to get a taste of different genres. She also has taught students a twist on a classic game by playing musical books. This allows students to move and groove while also introducing them to a variety of books they may have never stopped to check out on an ordinary day. For students who prefer a quiet space during re recess, Nichols welcomes them into the library to read, complete crafts, help with library tasks, or just engage in a friendly chat. As the student council advisor, Nichols coaches student leaders on how to facilitate meetings, plan activities, and turn their ideas into realities, while also helping raise funds for the school. Nichols is always ready to feed the minds of East Bluff Otters with creativity, and tonight we recognize you. <laughs> Last award recipient could not be here this evening, unless she snuck in on me, Carol. So Carol Brunel uh, from Mariners Elementary was unable to be here, as was her principal, Matt Rosenley. So I'm also going to try and do this one justice, even though she's not here. Carol Brunel, office manager at Mariners Elementary. Described at the, as the heartbeat of Mariners Elementary, office manager Carol Brunel greets everyone who enters the campus with such kindness that you all feel welcomed. Whether a parent, student, colleague, she wants everyone to feel welcomed at all times at the campus. To cultivate this feeling, Brunel led efforts to redecorate the staff lounge, adding new tables <coughs> and chairs, adding plants, and displaying words of encouragement throughout the lounge. Adding to the atmosphere are photos of employees with fun facts about them that she culled from a did you know questionnaire. Brunel welcomes new hires with sweet treats of home-baked cookies and kind notes. She also guides them to how to be successful on campus. No matter who she's interacting with, Brunel leads with kindness and compassion. So please join me in congratulating Carol Brunel. All of our award recipients, if you saw, are getting a glass award. They're also getting a wonderful certificate a lapel pen, and then a few other Newport Mesa branded items in their goodie bags. So I want to thank you so much. We have many amazing employees in our district, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to recognize just a few of them this evening. And if you'll allow me to invite Sean Bolton back up, I believe we have some unfinished business with the previous student recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. So Joyce did make it. Joyce Diakaris, who won the 48th District App Challenge in Washington, D.C. She'll be representing Newport Mesa and Newport Harbor High School on a national level. And again, at the end of the day, we ask all our students, whether the water polo players or Ryan Honoré or whoever you may be, staff or students, just to be a good person on campus 
and Joyce embodies that day in and day out like many of our students do. So Joyce Diakaros, 48th district or 47th district? I think it changed. It changed, right? So it's, <laughs> I know it's Michelle Steele, Congresswoman Michelle Steele's office, and so she won the app challenge in California, and she'll be representing the state, the district, and the school on a national level in Washington, D.C. Good evening, my name is Joyce Caros. I'm a junior at Newport Harbor High School, and last year, my computer science teacher at the time, Mr. Ballone, he introduced me to the Congressional App Challenge, and I wanted to make an app that's for mental health, and it's for students. It was called Ease, and basically students could write down their goals, whether it's big or small, and they could write down affirmations for themselves, and they could also see quotes throughout the day, and um, I submitted my app. Unfortunately, I got third place for our district, and I want to try again this year. So I created an app called Impact, and it informs students about global events, whether it's economic, social, maybe political, and so you can also find resources on how they can help to make an impact. So uh, I, an ongoing theme that I see with the apps that I've been creating is that um, no matter how small of a difference you think you might make. You're making a difference for yourself and you might make a difference for others and that's something that I want to show with the apps that I'm creating. Student board member reports are next. Trustee Crane. Yes, so uh, this board meeting, we are going to report on the topic of share with us the variety of clubs and organizations that exist on your campus. Also, please share two campus highlights. And today on the dais, we have Fernando Barañón representing Estancia High School, and we also have reports from Moss Elliott of Back Bay Monta Vista high school, and uh, Kate Cherry, Newport Harbor High School. So Fernando, if you'd like to go first. Hello, uh, hello, uh, school board president Anderson, yes. Superintendent Smith, and fellow board of trustees. Oh, yes. I just want to Fernan me Bass. Fernando, let's, let's uh, give the, oh, okay. the audience oh, sorry. Uh, some time so they can vacate the okay. boardroom. Transition time. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't even like the All right, Fernando, take two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, school board president Anderson, Superintendent Smith, and fellow board of trustees. At Estancia, we have gained a vast number of clubs and organizations. The primary clubs that exist on my school campus are the Leo Zions Club, our club, which stands for Acts of Random Kindness Club, Crew Club, Key Club, Culture Club, and HOSA. While the second semester started a few weeks ago, a notable event that Estancia held was our winter formal pep assembly. The energy was amazing as students were very excited to witness the teacher dance that we have every year led by Estancia staff and faculty members. Recently, the Acts of Random Kindness Club began their training to become advocates for mental health. The club partnered with the Orange County Department of Education in order to bring awareness to mental health and allow students to know the resources available to them. Part of this amazing partnership, the student advocates will be giving mental health, present mental health presentations to EHS staff, students, and parents in order to provide an outreach for mental health education. This will be a week-long campaign in May for Mental Health Awareness Month. As president of the Acts of Random Kindness Club, I am grateful and excited that we are able to make a difference in our school community. 
Thank you for listening to my school report. Thank you for coming. Moss, would you like to come up for Back Bay High School? Good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, board members, cabinet, and community. This week, the student board members were asked to name some of the clubs and organizations we have at our school. Back Bay doesn't have many, but it does have extracurricular activities. However, we do have a few great programs during school hours. As far as the more casual clubs, we have Multi Arts, Arts Club, which includes everything from painting to improv, and Board Game Club, which includes everything which includes things as even fun as ping pong competitions. <laughs> For those who want to get involved as p with part of the community, we have our Halo Club, which is a part of our nonprofit organization, Halo Dance for Autism, which was founded by our lovely dance and yoga teacher, Miss Marseille. Halo also just had a very successful show on Saturday. Another extracurricular school activity I take part is our social and emotional in-class sessions with Tilly's Learning Center to help us with resources, interacting with others, and directing our focus to things that matter to us. My personal favorite extracurricular activity we have in our is our five-week sailing program over at Orange Coast College's Professional Mariners Training Center, run by our life science teacher, Mr. Jane. By our, by our first class, we were already out on the water sailing our own boats. Finally, we have our district-wide and beyond regional occupational programs, or ROPs, which while aren't technically clubs, I believe get a similar enjoyment out of them. I am in the crime scene investigation ROP, which th includes things such as latent fingerprints, identify hair samples, and collecting evidence. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Moss. And now, Kate Cherry, representing Newport Harbor High School. Good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, and trustees. Tonight I was asked to report on clubs that we have at Newport Harbor and give only a small sample of over, the, of over 50 clubs that we have on campus. <laughs> I've come up with a list that I believe represents the entire range of interests that our students have, and I regret that I'm not able to share them all. Eight of our clubs include Latinos Unidos, Music Appreciation Club, Women in STEM, Blaze It Forward, CMB.IT, Helping Hands, Outdoor Adventures, and Surf Rider. Latinos Unidos works to promote and include, include Latinos and all students, host club meetings and events to improve inclusivity and diversity. Last year, their spring dance got a lot mm. of people involved, and it was a huge success. Um, music Appreciation Club is a new one this year that I've started that I'm proud of, is where students can get together to share music that they enjoy and connect with others over a shared interest. Women in STEM is dedicated to promoting women's participation in STEM and encouraging diversity in the STEM field offer science and math tutoring every week, as well as having female speakers to come talk about their careers in STEM and show how representation in, in STEM matters. Blaze It Forward works with students to learn about combating hate and spreading kindness on campus as well in life. CMB.IT is a team of coders who make and build websites or apps for the school and the community. Helping Hands focuses on tutoring underprivileged children whose families cannot afford tutoring and mentoring children who are going through hard times in their lives. Outdoor Adventures is a place where students who love being outdoors come together and go on adventures together outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> Surf Rider Foundation is a community foundation, but the one at our school also works with them, and they help to clean the shores of our local community while making our environment healthier and less polluted. I was also asked to share some recent campus highlights. We've only, we're only about a month into second semester, and already there's a lot happening at Newport Harbor. Last week was Bike Safety Week, and in which students were taught how to safely ride e-bikes e in the community, as well as encouraging students to register their bikes with the police. Students were given a donut if they registered, so <laughs> definitely boosting up the numbers. We also had winter formal a few weeks ago, and both the dance and rally were very successful with over half of our student body, which is roughly 1,100 students going to the dance and taking part in winter formal. It's one of our favorite events of the year, and so we're really glad that we got the success that we had. In athletics, the sailors have also been doing well with Tarpit, our student section being supportive of both home and away games like boys basketball battle of the bay and many of our winter sports teams have made it to cif this week and are currently in their first week of it all in all we're off to a great start of second semester and have even more to look forward to thank you and have a good evening thank you. next is our harbor council pta report Julie Lee. <clears throat> Good evening, President Anderson, board members, Dr. Smith, cabinet, and guests. My name is Julie Lank, and I'm Harbor Council PTA Auditor this year, and I want to share an update about Harbor Council. 
our holiday luncheon, we'd like to give a shout out to Newport High Harbor High School's culinary uh, students, its director, Sarah Pylon, and the music director, Jeffrey Leiden, and viol vocalists for a fabulous holiday luncheon in, in December. We have such incredibly talented students in our schools, and it was honor to have them showcased at our venue. The Reflections Art Program. We had 26 entries who advanced to the fourth district uh, reflections level of judging. Of the 26, three are advancing to California State PTA. The fourth di district reflections reception is this coming Saturday, February 11th at the Orange County Department of Education from 2 to 4 p.m. Sacramento Safari is coming up at the end of February. We have five representatives attending this two-day educational and advocacy training trip to Sacramento. Through scheduled events to the legislator and representatives, our leaders learn how to how the legislative system works and about advocacy and pending litigation. Meet with PTA advocates and hear from key speakers on issues that affect children, youth, and their families. Fentanyl, big topic. Uh, the Orange County Sheriff's Department provided an informative presentation about fentanyl at our Harbor Council General PTA meeting yesterday. And our leaders, myself included, um, received Narcon training and resources to bring back to their school sites and to share with parent communities. I personally carried in my car, so I'm very honored to, to have that privilege. Anyways, um, membership update. Harbor Council has 6,295 PTA members in the Newport Mesa and 90,000 in our district PTA. Our district PTA is the largest in California and is larger than most states' PTAs. Wow. So thank you for letting wow. me share. Thank you. Um, we will have our CSEA um, president's comment. <clears throat> President Anderson, trustees, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, and guests. Um, when the water polo coach was up here, uh, he talked about leadership, and it really resonated with me because in the last couple of days, um, starting about middle of last week, this board and this district really showed itself in its leadership to the classified folks. Um, we were um, privileged to participate in the Labor Management Initiative, which is a program that allows us to uh, have a day of training that teaches us how uh, you guys do your work, how the cabinet does their work, and um, what we can do to better the relationships between us. We work together in small groups, we work together in larger groups, and we learned a lot about each other, and I think it's a very valuable program, and I really want to say thank you to the folks that made it happen. I really do want to acknowledge that. Um, coming up soon is our Classified Employees Week, which is in May. Um, we have um, a program that I want to try to bring back, which is the ACE program, Appreciating Classified Employees. It's a program where we have um, people in the higher positions in our district and board members shadow um, some of our classified folks, help them do their work, sometimes even do their work. Uh, we won't let you drive a bus, <laughs> but we will let you do other things to let you uh, have an appreciation and, and uh, uh, an understanding of how important the work that we do is. And uh, we really appreciate getting to know our board members and our, um, our uh, uh, you know, bigger people in the district better and more on a more personable level. That way, when we do have these issues, which happened today, uh, I feel like I can go to the top and get the help that I need. And the thing is, that's really true in this district, if that is that if you build the relationships and you take the time to give of yourself, then you can be assured that when you need help, it will be there for you. And I just wanted to uh, say thank you to the people, and you know who you are, Wes, but <laughs> Leona especially. Um, I want to thank you for uh, the last couple of weeks. You really uh, showed me what leadership's all about, and I appreciate that. And uh, I'd like to just take uh, one more second of your time to introduce our two uh, newest board members. Peggy's returning e-board member as our public, no, our, our webmaster. <laughs> 
back as my secretary, which is uh, absolutely awesome because I couldn't run the place without her. Anyway, thank you for your time, and I really appreciate the uh, the uh, relationships that we have, and I hope they continue in the future. Thank you. NMFT President Rhonda Reed. Good evening, President Anderson, trustees, um, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, and guests here tonight. So NMFT, uh, like Stu said, we are also very uh, grateful and thankful to the district for providing the leadership management uh, initiative training last week. It was a great opportunity to continue the conversation and be more intentional about how we can improve upon our collaborative relationships. The best part of the training, though, was how we could spend time with um, diverse people, um, classified, certificated, and management personnel that we normally don't get to spend much time with and learning um, fun details about them. In all of our busyness, it also was a joy to have um, time to reflect on our practices and processes. As we move into full steam into second semester, we want to take this time to thank all of our teachers who are doing tremendous work teaching our students. And they are doing extraordinary efforts to bridge the learning challenges that none of us knew at the time of the tremendous impact of the COVID lockdown that we would continue to be um, having issue with now. We also want to thank our social workers, psychologists, school counselors, and nurses for their professional skills in promoting social emotional well-being as the mental health toll of the distant learning has been well documented. Thank you. Trustee Wagon. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items not on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on non-agenda topics are limited to three minutes per comment up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. By order of the Brown Act, section 54954.2, the board will take no action nor have any discussion on non-agendized items. The superintendent may provide clarification during superintendent comments. Do we have any comments? We do, yes. We have Betsy Fisher. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Betsy Fisher. I'm a teacher at Newport Harbor, a Costa Mesa resident and the parent of two graduates from Newport Harbor. I had planned to come to speak with you tonight, unaware that the school safety plans were on the agenda, and this is uh, purely by coincidence. Uh, my topic does apply to health and safety of our young people and professional development. Three words, CPR, Narcan, and AED. We all know what CPR is. Narcan is a nasal spray used to revive opioid overdose, and AED is automated external defibrillator. It's a device used to resuscitate um, people who have suffered sudden cardiac arrest. Some stats in three short minutes. California Department of Public Health reports that in 2021, there were 7,000 opioid-related deaths in our state. Many of those deaths were young people between 15 and 19, and they were related to fentanyl. Stat number two. You may have seen, but certainly have heard of the Buffalo Bills player who had a heart attack on national television. On an episode of HBO's Real Sports, a professor from University of Connecticut estimated two times per week, a high school athlete suffers from sudden cardiac arrest, resulting in 100 deaths per year of high school athletes. I leave you with this request. It's not a big ask. I ask that the professional development days that we endure every August be used to provide training for CPR, Narcan and the AED device. Certificated, classified administrators, board members, we all have a common responsibility to keep our young people safe. There may be nothing worse if we or any of us must someday live with the failure that results in the death of a young person. There might be nothing worse than to have failed a child when there was something we could have done but did not. I'm not speaking of a failure because of lack of care, indifference, or intentional disregard, but a failure resulting from our inability to render aid for lack of resources, 
and training. Perhaps there is already a plan in place for those PD days in August, some new teaching methods, some seminar on artificial intelligence. There may even be something in the works related to the purchase of some expensive technology, tech program, or new gadget. But in reality, there is no new training or any tech program that could ever be more important than giving us the tools, the training, and the confidence to render aid to save a child's life. Please hire some real people to teach us not watching a video, not interactive computer training. That's not good teaching, not good learning. And you can trust me, I'm an expert on this. So I, I hope that you will look at the training in August and use those days for something that's really for good. Thank you. Thank you. Really no clarification. She was pretty clear about what she's asking for. <laughs> Be a bit rude for me to clarify. I would only say that the people in the room that plan those dates or help our colleagues plan those dates are, are here. Um, and while I've never needed Narcan, I have uh, or would say that I'm here tonight because of CPR and an AED for 11 and a half minutes. So we know that it's important. Um, and so you've been heard. Thank you, Trustee Wagon. All right, now it's uh, community input on agendized items. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular ag meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board if the speaker prefers. Do we have any cards? None? Seeing none? Okay. Okay, um, next up is our report on secondary learning acceleration. Dr. Torres. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, pleased to be back in front of you this evening. Carrie Torres, our Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. And I'd like to welcome um, my team who's with me tonight as well. Um, you've met Dr. Shocker, heard from him a couple of times this evening. He's our Director of um, Secondary Teaching and Learning. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's very 2022 of me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> He is our administrative director of secondary, and we have our Mr. Keith Carmona, who joined us recently, who is our director of teaching and learning. So um, here's our team this evening. And um, Keith is three weeks on the job, and so as part of our team, he's our lead learner tonight, so he's learning about our programs as well, but he is part of our team, so I wanted to make sure you all know that um, Mr. Carmona will be leading the efforts as we move forward with a lot of our professional development and work around the presentation you're gonna hear this evening. Um, but Dr. Shaka was a part of this work and so he'll be presenting with me tonight. So what we wanna to talk to you tonight about is really the learning acceleration for secondary students. And you know, we um, have heard a lot about learning loss, but one of the things that we like to focus on is really the learning acceleration of students. Because if you think about the time that students spent during COVID and during the pandemic, there were many students who just didn't actually have access to learning. So they really didn't lose anything. They actually just didn't gain anything. It was almost like a, a punctuated moment in time where things stopped for many of our learners. And while we provided a robust program, there were still students who needed more than we could offer at that moment. And so tonight, I want you to consider the fact that we are constantly looking to regain the academic ground where students were stopped. And so we look at that in three areas, and we're looking at wellness, attendance, and credits. Keep in mind that a high school student, and we're gonna to focus tonight on high school, our main goal for high school students is to ensure that they have a wonderful experience with us and graduate from high school, priority one. Priority two would be to make sure they leave with a post-secondary plan. So we wanna make sure not only are they leaving us whole and graduating, but that they have a plan. 
and that they've had that tremendous experience with us. So as you listen to us tonight, we present data from our team. Um, we want you to think about that. How are we regaining academic ground? And we have this program that you're going to hear about tonight at all of our high schools. Um, but we have decided tonight to focus our energies on Estancia High School. So we'll have a spotlight and highlight on Estancia. And we'll be welcoming, uh, welcoming up um, Estancia in just a few slides. Um, once again, high school in grades 9 through 12, it really is something that we think about when we talk about the gateway for opportunity. And while many of us have achieved the goal of high school diploma, we still have students who are struggling to get there. And so it's our duty and responsibility to ensure that we're doing whatever we can so that we can ensure students have a positive impact. Because we know that if students don't obtain their high school diploma, that it presents challenges for them, such as uh, prospective employment challenges, lack of um, financial resources, and potentially compromising health situations. It just puts students in a deficit early on in life, and so we're constantly looking at ways to ensure that we can continue to move students forward. And just a few uh, pieces of background information. The first thing to know is in Newport Mesa, a student, in order to graduate, needs to accomplish a, a 230 credits. So if you think about the 230 credits, really that means 60 credits per year with a, a 10 credit buffer during that senior year. Now, that's significantly different than what the state minimum of 130 credits is. So it's important to acknowledge that Newport Mesa has 230 credit graduation requirement for our district. Prior to 2020, that was in place. Once COVID hit, there was a number of, of different laws, assembly bills that gave us as educators tools to help some of the students most impacted by the pandemic. So we were able to uh, successfully get them to uh, mitigate some of the challenges in their lives and get them graduated. So if you look at the timeline, 2020, um, prior to 2020, 230 units. Then we had some different legislations that came out. Um, AB 104 was one of the ones we really used and that gave us some tools um, in certain situations to allow students to graduate with the state minimum of 130 credits. Now, those, th those pieces of legislation have changed and some of which are about to expire. So this year's senior class is our last class that will be given the 220 credit requirement. And after this year's senior class, it will go back up to 230 units. So just wanna make sure that we had a little bit of background of the timeline what we encountered over the last couple of years and what we anticipate going back to in the near future. And that's really important for us to ground ourselves in because when we're talking about where students are at and where they're trying to move towards, those numbers are exceptionally important to them. Um, it is important to hear just a moment uh, of, of explanation regarding some of the legislation that was passed and ground us in that work. Um, we've had legislation for some of our subgroups in the past. We had um, our first column, AB 1806, 216, and 167, has always protected our students who are McKinney, Bento, and foster youth. And so we've been fortunate that we've had that legislation for any of our students who qualify in that area to graduate with those 130 credits, and we do that as necessary. And then we had AB uh, 104, which this board may have passed, um, some of you board members who were present during our um, pandemic, which really allowed students who were emerging from the pandemic in 11th and 12th grade who were not making it to use the 130 credits. And that was very beneficial to all of our high schools. We had a handful of students in every school who were able to really utilize that to move them on. They were, too, they were short too much. We couldn't get them across the threshold without being able to use that opportunity. And then looking towards the future, we have SB 532, which is expanding the rights of some of our subgroup students, such as foster youth, um, homeless, um, incarcerated youth, and now to include migratory um, families, so those that are moving around quite a bit, and English learner newcomers, which is really important to us, and military students. And so now we're not just looking at legislation for foster youth and homeless, but we've expanded that in the state of California. And so we do have some students who will benefit from that, particularly our English learner population who are newcomers coming into us 
in 11th and 12th grade. So that's something that'll be on the horizon that you'll be seeing or hearing more of because that was just passed um, this year and went into effect on January 1st. So let's look at some of the data. What you're looking at right here is some historical data of Newport Mesa. And, and what it is, is you're seeing the number or percentage of students who are on track, this is nine through 12, who are on track on credits, which means they've accomplished 60 credits at the end of their ninth grade year, 100, or 120 at the end of the sophomore, 180 at the end of the junior, and then 220 plus at the end of their senior year. So as you can see, looking at what was more typical prior to the pandemic, 2018-19, you had about 7.5% 7 of our students that were um, high risk, which means more than 10 credits behind. And then you've got another about 7.5% that were between 1 and 10 credits behind at the end of the year. And so that's kind of typically um, where we've been. You can see as the pandemic hit, um, that percentage has gone up. And what we are looking at at the end of last year is a, a, a number of about 13.4% of our students were more 10 or more credits behind. And so clearly that was a concerning number for us. Um, and luckily with different tools that we have that uh, Ms. Torres just outlined, we were able to get many of them across the finish line for graduation. But we monitor this data very, very closely. You can see this broken down by grade level. So you can kind of see um, ninth grade year, the percentage of students that are uh, further behind, that are not on track, and that are on track. Our sophomore and junior year seem to be where those bubbles are of students that have um, a higher percentage of off-trackness. And then by senior year, that number goes back down for a variety of reasons. Um, but we have um, uh, you know, closer to 6% of our students who are off-track by their senior year. And then finally, you can see um, by some of our different student groups, um, uh, unfortunately, we have some of our highest risk student groups that are the furthest behind. So this is the data that we certainly like to um, know about, we like to confront, and we like to plan for and figure out how we can uh, change trends and help these students. So that was the uh, less than ideal portion of the presentation. So now I'd like to shift gears and talk about what we're, what we're doing about this. Because um, looking at the data and acknowledging the data is one thing. Um, acting upon the data to, to change students' um, outcomes is the next part. So the top two squares that you're looking at, credit recovery and part of summer school, those are approaches to uh, a reactive approach. So that's what we're doing to help the students who are already behind to try to get them caught up. So we have to include a reactive approach to help the students that are already in a position that's not ideal. So if you look at credit recovery, we have 13 additional credit recovery sections across our high schools to offer, offer opportunities for students to make up uh, credits uh, in, in a, a different venue. We also have part of our summer school uh, plan is that remediation component that the students could come to summer school and make up actual credits so that they started the next year uh, more caught up. And as we talked about at the summer school presentation a number of months ago, we had somewhere in the ballpark of 4,000 credits that students made up just last year alone because uh, we were able to scale up the opportunity so much in summer school. Now shifting to a more proactive approach, because on one hand, we want to help the students who are in that situation. On the other hand, we want to reduce the number of students who fall behind in the first place. That comes to the second part of summer school, where we had the seventh grade, eighth grade, and ninth grade bridge programs, which were designed to set the kids up for success the following year to where they could take the classes, experience more success in those English classes, in those math classes, and not fall behind in the first place. Uh, one particularly successful example is the ninth grade bridge, where the students who traditionally were behind in middle school were able to take the ninth grade bridge, get a, a kickstart in ELA and math curriculum, and start their ninth grade year with five elective credits. So they were starting ahead of everyone else as opposed to behind. Moving down to the student support sections, we have 90 additional off-ratio support sections across our high schools that are designed to help students in a variety of ways. These look like a lot of different things. Some are used for reading. Some are used for tutor core. Some are used for life skills, 
um, or, or study skills type classes used in a variety of ways to help our students stay on track. And then you see we have five additional math pre-teach sections. Again, that is the math class that is paired with an Algebra I class designed to uh, set the kids up for success that the day of their Algebra lesson. So they walk in, they might go to Algebra pre-teach first period or second period, and Algebra is maybe fourth period. And so they get those pre-teach skills, so they walk into their Algebra class confident, prepared to be active contributors and active learners in that class. However, all of these interventions and supports only work within a system. And I think that's where our fifth box um, really takes us. And that's what we've done a little bit different, is we have these supports, but without a system and a system manager at the site level, it becomes less effective. We currently have admin interns at all eight, uh, at four middle schools and four of our high schools, as well as um, similar supports at some of our alternative schools to help run these systems and ensure that the students are, are moving within the system as effectively as possible. So our admin interns. Our admin interns really look at two things. The systemic approach to um, student intervention, student placement, um, and an aligned effort, meaning that they work within uh, a team of admin interns, all eight of them collaborate monthly, share ideas, create systems, look at data, talk about students, and talk about how they can be more effective. Within the systemic approach, um, they look at resource, look at effectiveness and efficacy of that resource, and then alter that resource based off the data that they're seeing. Um, clearly, data review is a big part of this, uh, this process. They meet monthly, and they also engage in professional development and coaching. So um, we're not just reinventing the wheel eight different times. We're, we're working with uh, different professionals and different experts to ensure that our, our approach is effective as possible. This is a, a picture and outcome from one of the trainings that we did with our instructional coaches. And while it's not um, super self-explanatory, I think what it does is it outlines the process of which our admin interns follow. And if you look at that, kind of those boxes from left to right, the first one is identifying students in need. Then the very next one is um, diagnosing the need. So here's a student need. Let's start to diagnose the need. What does this student need? And then moving on to identifying metrics um, of success. So once we identify what the student needs, how are we going to measure the growth towards our desired outcome? Let's not just hope good things happen and point to good things that may or may not be happening in that student life, but let's pre-identify metrics that we want to influence ahead of time. Then we match our resource to the metric and to the student. So if a student, for example, um, is behind in reading, we may match them to reading intervention class. So matching the resource to the student is the next step in that, in that process. Then we monitor them for uh, you know, on, track, on trackness. So continued monitoring, that's really where the data comes in. Every day, every week, we're looking at that data. Are they making adequate progress? Um, and then finally, if you look at that final, uh, final box on the right, that's kind of our fork in the road. And that's what I think they're doing extremely effective at the moment, which is there's three outcomes when a student is, is receiving a support. The, the first outcome is they're making progress. They're, they're moving in the direction we want. And it's a matter of monitoring and saying, you know what, it, it, it seems to be working. We're making progress. In which case, you see the arrow go back to monitoring on trackness. And we continue to monitor. And you go through that cycle. And uh, that's a, a positive outcome. Um, the second is if the student is not responding to the resource. If the student's not responding to the resource, then we go back to matching resource to need. And we reevaluate, is the particular resource we have for the students, is that intervention the right one? What adjustments do we need to make? Not just stay the course in, without results, but continue to monitor. And then finally, the third and the most desirable is the, the picture of the happy student at the end who has not only progressed, but has progressed their way out of the need for, for the resource. And that's ultimately our goal for all of our students, for our students to progress out. Then we can monitor them, but um, they, they no longer require that resource. At this point, I'd like to introduce um, two people that um, I, I think uh, tell a very exciting, interesting story. Uh, Principal Mike Holt from Estancia and Denise Moore, our admin intern from Estancia High School. So Mike and Denise. Thank you, Mike. 
Uh, trustees, uh, the title uh, admin intern may reflect uh, Denise's pay classification, but that's about it. Uh, <laughs> our students and staff know her as Estancia's graduation coach, and her work is modeled after the high school graduation coach position that exists in nearly two dozen states across the country. Like many high school principals, I've gotten very skilled at the use of data, and we use a standardized approach to collaborative inquiry to quickly identify students who are at risk of not achieving on-time graduation. But once identification is made, the real work must begin. As you will see, Denise does an outstanding job of knowing our school's data, knowing each student on her caseload, and connecting each student to a personalized and powerful intervention plan so that on-time graduation can once again become a goal that's attainable. In this role, she fills a vital niche uh, that counselors and teachers often cannot because they are too busy, their caseloads are too large, and our student needs are simply too great. Our graduation coach forms deep relationships with the students who are on her caseload, and she guides them towards believing in themselves again, attending class regularly, making up missed credits, and building academic skills. And it's my pleasure to introduce Denise Moore, our graduation coach slash admin intern. Thank you. Just to give you a little background, um, I spent about 13 years as an English teacher at Estancia. I taught during um, distance learning and I taught during hybrid learning as well. And um, I've been able to and continue, um, I, and I'm continu continuing to uh, be program coordinator of our Link Crew ninth grade transition program and I'm also an instructional coach too. And all of this has Help me facilitate the right conversations in my role as graduation coach um, around learning acceleration post-pandemic. Um, my job, as outlined by Shaka, uh, is really that, that process of identifying students in need and matching them with appropriate interventions and resources, monitoring their progress, and making adjustments to their systems of support as needed. And the way I do this is at each grading mark, I identify students who have two or more failing grades, and I add them to my caseload. And when it comes to the incoming ninth graders, I have established a process um, of communication with our feeder school, T. Winkle, uh, so that I am not basing um, assessment of student needs solely on grades, but also other information as well. Um, at the beginning, of each semester, I work with our counselors to revisit student course schedules and make sure students are in the right course placements or intervention classes. And throughout the semester, I have a system of academic progress monitoring where I look at student coursework and grades, and I pull in students individually to conference, to goal set, to plan, and to match students with needed resources. And oftentimes, especially during the semester, those needed resources are social emotional resources. So counseling referrals or community-based referrals as well. Um, I meet with all my caseload students quarterly in a group setting through their intervention classes to conduct lessons uh, based on group need. Often uh, we go over graduation requirements, we go over our four-year plans. We create and make adjustments to those. Um, we goal set for weeks to come, and we reflect on weeks past. Um, and we have even done some career exploration. And while our counselors do a good job of these type, presenting these lessons as well throughout their four-year experience in, in high school, um, they get this kind of personalized follow-up um, and, and touch point um, doing the same kind of work. And for the students who do not show progress, I hold parent, uh, parent meetings, place students on academic contracts to help them clearly understand expectations for graduation and learning, uh, problem solve with families, and continue to identify and address barriers to student learning, including bigger system or process inefficiencies. But ultimately, we have two large goals for student learning. On my caseload, that's one passing current classes and not falling further behind, and two, making up lost credit from semesters past. But I'm just one piece of a bigger approach to that learning acceleration that Mr. Halt's gonna briefly outline for you. And uh, 
What I'd like to highlight is just uh, a couple of more of our systematic approach to ensuring that all students have the opportunity for on-time graduation. Uh, all students at Estancia, through our EGLE uh, tutorial and advisory program, have an opportunity for either directed or self-directed tutorial assistance four times a week. At Estancia, we realize that the two groups that struggle the most in every high school are freshmen and English language learners. So we ensure that all students in those two groups receive extra attention, extra support, and additional classes. Uh, because the freshman year can be difficult and navigating your way through the high school graduation and college requirement entrance uh, can be a challenge, our practice at Estancia is to ensure that all sophomores and their parents meet with their uh, high school counselor to go over exactly where they're at and where they want to go to achieve on-time graduation and post-secondary plans. And because no student and no parent should ever be caught off guard and surprised by their student's graduation status, our administrators, our administrators and counselors meet with all upperclassmen who are off track for graduation so that they know what resources, supports, and options are available to them. And I'd like to really turn it back to Denise to talk about the work that she does and the outcomes that uh, we're hoping to see. So we'll just show you a couple big pictures here. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, first one you're going to see on the screen is kind of a, a big picture shot of the caseload I had last year who exited and where they're at currently. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, the orange, those three students in orange, um, have fallen back off track. They're not on track right now, and they've come back on my caseload, but only three out of my caseload that have exited. Over 80% of last year's caseload exited. Only three students, like I said, have returned to that caseload for this year. And. Yeah. And there, uh, the next picture is that of um, one of our goals that I mentioned, which is, which one is this? This one is um, getting, getting the students caught up um, and, and recovering the credits. So you have here a picture of how many credits were recovered for our 10th graders on the left and how many for caseload 11th graders on the right. And you can see that the majority of students are catching up, and there's a significant number that are catching up um, significantly. <laughs> so that's uh, specifically between summer and quarter one. And then the next picture is that of our second, our second goal, our other goal which is um, making sure our students don't fall any further behind where they're at now. And the picture on the left, again, you can see is our 10th grade caseload this year, my 10th grade caseload this year. Um, over half of them have, this last semester, um, did not fail any, uh, any class, and they have not fallen farther behind. And um, there's about 30% of them that did better than they were at when they got on the caseload at the beginning of the semester. And the 11th grade is even showing more progress. Denise works with um, a select uh, group of students. And what this last slide tries to show you is um, where we stand at Estancia when it comes to uh, accelerated learning. As uh, Denise mentioned, there's really two parts. There's reversing uh, trends of negative outcomes. In other words, making sure that every student passes their class the first time. Uh, and then there's the opportunity to recover credit if we're unsuccessful in that goal. If you think about the uh, data that uh, Mike Shaka put up first that had where we sit as a district and what, um, where the bar was the, uh, had the most red, as that's at the sophomore level. Uh, what we've seen is that the data at Estancia mirrors the data that we see district-wide. And I leave this with you, and it really brings home the point that the students who are struggling the most and rebounding the slowest are our underclassmen. And the key takeaway from this is that the challenge of learning acceleration is not merely limited to the students who had a portion of their high school career um, disrupted by COVID. Our data analysis and the collaborative work we've been doing with our feeder schools leaves us to believe that the real challenge of post-COVID learning acceleration is just beginning. And we look forward to working with district staff to meet this emergent 
uh, challenge in order to help ensure on-time graduation for all students throughout the district. And we thank you for your time and support. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> I love this picture. Um, just because, uh, not just because it's, it's Mr. Hall, but you know, that's really what it's all about, right? Is the, um, for a high school student is to ensure that they be able to, they're able to graduate. Um, really proud of the work that we're doing and really proud of the work of the graduation coach, AKA admin intern. Um, we have very seasoned high school principals, which is fantastic because they know their communities. They know their students. They know where the needs are. Um, and you're starting to see the results of the work of the labor that they've put in and the investments that we've made as a district. Um, are there any questions for our team this evening? Trustee Murphy? Um, yeah, no, that was great. Are these on? Doesn't matter. Um, um, so thank you for um, clarifying how they're identified. With two failing grades, you said, and what other factors? Just curious. Just the grades. That's it. So no behavior or any, no anything behavior. else comes into play? If a student is showing progress and moving in the right direction and, and they don't have failing grades, um, even if they're credit deficient, they're, they're making that progress on their own, we don't see them as needing me anymore. That doesn't mean I'm not watching them, though. We're still monitoring. But to be identified originally, it's only just by two failing grades. That was the intent of the position was really to keep students on track credit, mm -hmm. you know, credit wise and or credit deficient students. That's what the design was. And then our admin interns do a wonderful job at connecting resources. So if a student comes forward and you're, you hear about those um, emotional concerns that somebody may have or other concerns, we can connect those resources. Great. And then how were they assessed? You mentioned assessed after they you, you identify them? Um, oh, their needs. Their, their needs. needs. It's how are they assessed? It's a lot of um, talking to teachers and individual conferencing with the student to find out exactly what they need, what's going on, um, where their motivations are, what's going on at home. Um, you know, just like an intake process. Yeah, right? just questioning. Lots of questioning as part of the assessment. That's great. I had a bunch of questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, well, that was actually, that was it. And then, because um, actually you answered most of them as I was writing, so thank you. It was a great presentation. Um, is this, uh, is this? It, I'm assuming it's in all of the high schools, right? Mm -hmm. We just picked Estancia because they're so amazing. <laughs> okay. Yes, the spotlight tonight was on Estancia, but we do have these at all of our um, eight secondary schools, and we have a modified version at our alternative sites. Uh, I think Dr. Bolton is still in the room, so he can verify. We have one at um, Newport Harbor as well. Um, and it's an investment that we are interested in keeping. We have some um, next steps and just sharing with you tonight what the program is, but we are seeing growth. Um, part of the work that um, Socorro and I do and John is really looking at outcomes and metrics and is what we're doing working. And Dr. Smith is always asking us, how do we know if what we're doing is working and are these investments getting what we wanted out of it, right? Is this the intent and is it meeting the intent? And programs like this are showing us that they are. That's amazing, that's great. Yeah. And then last question, sorry. <laughs> gosh. Um, do you ever do any, you said you made some refer referrals, some community referrals, social emotional referrals. And then I was wondering, do you refer to CTE? Because maybe that's a pathway. Yes, actually, I find that a lot of my caseload students are already in a pathway. We have pretty strong pathway programs at Estancia. Um, but if I career, potential career interests are always part of our conversation. And if I see a possible connection to be made, we take that opportunity. Great. And in closing to that comment, one of the other things we're bringing on board is a work-based learning um, coordinator as part of our CTE grant that uh -huh. we've received. Because what we do know is we need to connect student interests to create a passion and a desire to attend and to achieve. Um, and so that is part of the work that you're going to be seeing coming forward is we will be having that as an additional um, opportunity for students so our admin interns and graduation coaches can connect students to rich opportunities in the community. That's great. Thank you. Okay, we have student board member. Fernando. Hi. So I know from my knowledge, I know that that typically uh, Estancia sends students to back pay for like credit recovery. Will the work that you be doing 
like decreased um, the rate of students that end up going up going to back bay? Um, that's the hope. That's the hope. We're going to try and intervene before um, it's too late to, or we run out of time to make up credits at Estancia. That's where Back Bay comes into play is when we, we're in a position where we have no more time left at Estancia, um, those referrals come in. So we want to stop that process early. Thank you. Trustee Crane. Fernando, that was an excellent question. Truly good job. <laughs> Perhaps we ha you have a future on this dais later. <laughs> <laughs> Just planting the seed, that's all. Um, so uh, excellent intentional work. I, I did have a couple of questions. You, def you defined high risk as 10 plus uh, credit uh, deficient. What is the not on track yellow definition? Sure. So um, uh, we consider a student uh, at risk for graduation if they are uh, more than two classes off. So that's 10 or, uh, you know, five or 10. Uh, if they are more than three classes, so 10 or above, then we consider them significantly at risk. So, so high risk is 10. Is more than 10. So and then not on track. Yes, 15. Uh, okay. And then the not on track part, did I miss? No, that's your, you're considered not on track. I remember when Dr. Shaka started off, our goal to ensure on-time graduation is uh, hitting 60 units uh, okay. each year. There we go. Um, okay. So uh, if you fall 10 uh, units off that pass, we yes. consider you uh, at risk, and then you're significantly at risk if you are greater than 10, which oh, is typically it. at the high school level 15 or more. Oh, thank you. And then um, do the, these high-risk students, do they end up, uh, do you encourage them to, to attend summer school, or do they not have a choice? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Denise is so good at encouraging. Because I figured you have to, uh, you know, catch up on time. Between uh, en yeah. encouragement and the end result. So yes, no, uh, we we, we want to encourage all students to take advantage of every opportunity yes. uh, that we provide. So um, whether that's offering additional classes, uh, you know, the simple fact is is that the majority of students at Estancia don't take uh, the the accepted minimum of, of six uh, six classes. Right. Uh, we program all. Uh, incoming ninth graders for uh, for a minimum of seven, and uh, students who are uh, ambitious and uh, um, excited about uh, career opportunities uh, through our pathways are often taking seven classes, as are students who are in our um, uh, AP classes. So uh, those are the minimums, and we uh, yeah. typically exceed them. And lastly, since we uh, we mentioned summer school, um, the parent element in this parent engagement, yeah. would you mind clarifying to the public how you involve the families as a whole so we can look at the bigger Specific picture? summer school or in general? Uh, no, the summer school was kind of a lead-in to okay. just how do you engage the parents? Um, they come into the intervention process, the conversation, um, the problem-solving meetings after we don't see progress. Um, with my initial interventions, my right. matching with resources, my individual conferencing. Um, then we start having parent meetings and, and they're part of our plan. We sit down and we put them on academic contracts and we problem solve what's going on together as a family. Um, and oftentimes parents don't know what to do. <laughs> but that's, that's but great that you reach out. Exactly, they need to be mm -hmm. part of the conversation. Yeah. That's why. It's great that you include them. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and, uh, and add on the one thing that, you know, Denise's work uh, is um, aided greatly by the two school community facilitators that we have at yes. Estancia. So, you know, Good. our families face uh, a lot of challenges, but the mm -hmm. language is language barrier is never one. Mm -hmm. um, Denise works side by side with both uh, Laura and Ugo, uh, making sure that uh, every parent uh, knows that their voice will be heard, that their concerns will be met, and that uh, partnership and strong homeschool connection will always exist. Thank you. Any other questions? Trustee Ursula? Just one small one. It was really great. Everything is great. Is there any way that the name can be changed just to graduation coach for every, is everybody everywhere being called a graduation coach? Because in, in, to, to what Trustee Crane was saying in terms of communicating this out to the public and the great work, I was with you and then I saw, oh wow, all this great stuff's being put in the hands of interns. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so if we could just call them graduation coaches yeah. for like community oh, morale, knowing that like sure. the great work is 
being Rebrand. done by a great qualified Thank person. Thank you, Trustee Asarlin. That's the actual. Uh, <laughs> if, we could give, if we could just have credit for just a moment, too, uh, for all, because actually we hired the position. So um, the position is called, like in, in HR, it's called an admin intern. It's the actual position in the district, and that's how it got its name. Um, because it's not a principal, it's not an assistant principal, it's not a teacher, so it's its own position. Um, and then we started to talk about intent. Um, Mr. Halt is the one who came up for his school with that identity. And so that is something we've discussed um, because that is the intent of the work. And so while some of our admin interns on occasion have to do a few other things during their day, the intent of this position is really to do what you heard tonight and to really move students to graduation. And so that is something that we would love to take into consideration as we brand it and move forward. So thank you. Thank you. I absolutely, I absolutely agree. That's a great point. I just want to thank you, Denise. This is incredible work that you're doing and so needed. So thank you. And thank you, Principal Halt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is our update on the Estancia High School theater design. Mr. Trader. We are making substantial progress on the theater at Estancia, and we have Otto Wiggins, who is our uh, f district's facility director, to provide you with an update. Good evening, President Anderson. I got it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Smith, board, um, executive cabinet, and guests, thank you all for having us. Um, I did want to let you know that it's not just myself tonight. Um, I have Sonia Lester with architect, uh, excuse me, our architect firm, Pfeiffer Partners. And really the intent tonight is to present to you where we have come from relocating the theater from site two to site three and show you how that plan has developed. Um, so Sonia will be taking you through the presentation, which I should pull up here. Let's see here. There we go. Um, but what I wanted to share with you was the last time that we spoke and we gave you an update. We had told you that we were preparing to submit to DSA last year to get our project in the um, 2022 code cycle and not have to change major components of the design. And so we had done that in December and we had also met with DSA to talk about the final design coming forward and they gave us some leeway with submitting a complete design on January 31st. So we have done that. Um, in addition to that, as we go through the presentation, Sonia will talk to you about um, what you're looking at on the screen, and then you'll have me chiming in um, <laughs> with some of the feedback that we've received. So since we presented the last plan, we have met with um, the theater site committee. So that has some community members, the uh, performing arts teachers, the site administrators, the facility staff, the architect, everybody kind of in the room. We've also met independently with the drama teacher to go through the fine details of the project that maybe she had questions on, which she had prepared a list of questions. Uh, we have met with, uh, rather than just a theater tech that would be assigned to Estancia, we brought in all of our theater techs throughout the district, mm -hmm. including their manager and their, um, their administrative director, which is the maintenance director, Lance Bidnick. So we've met with all of them to run them through the project and receive feedback from them. We have also, um, we have a regular meeting with the Estancia administrators, so that's ongoing. We're always talking about all the projects at their campus. Uh, so that's been happening as well. And then we also met with the city of Costa Mesa to talk about some of the impacts of relocating the theater and further work that would happen beyond the theater scope currently associated with the other parking stalls and circulation and student safety. So that'll be an ongoing conversation Good. that really has just started. So we'll continue to do that. But tonight, uh, Sonia gets to present the project to you and then I will chime in. <laughs> It's hard for me to stay quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Otto. Is this okay? Great. Okay. So this is an aerial of the Estancia campus, 
And what you see here are the various sites that were under consideration initially when the building was being designed and then also when it was uh, considered to be relocated. Um, the square footages that are associated with each of the sites just represents the amount of area that was available on that site. The actual building footprint is about 20,000 square feet at the first level. So you can see that after we were directed uh, to go to proceed with site three, that it really allowed us the opportunity to get some breathing room and to be able to site the building as a freestanding element. And that, by doing that, we were able to reduce a lot of the complexity with the original design of building right up against the gymnasium and also reduce some of the uh, disruption that may happen during construction. So some of the first considerations that we made when we looked at relocating the site was how the building may have to be modified to accommodate the site. The goal of the project was not to change the program, but to maintain the program, not to grow the, the, the building, uh, but really just to make as many minor modifications that were needed so that we could get back into DSA and keep the project moving forward. So some of those considerations that we first started looking at were access to the site. So we were actually able to utilize the two existing entrances um, that were uh, the north one coming into the existing parking lot and then maintaining about 35 spots, parking spots, along the Placentia buffer zone. The 58 that you see referenced there is really also referencing spots that are located in the south uh, banana lot. Mm -hmm. um, so just saying that there are about 58 spots that are r relatively close and accessible to the building, as well as we're restriping some accessible spots uh, on the south uh, on the bottom of the page uh, for handicap accessibility to ensure that there's easy access into uh, to the um, new theater building. What we also wanted to do was incorporate uh, vehicular drop-off so that when uh, patrons or students are being dropped off that it's not impeding upon the traffic uh, of the, the parking lot itself. Um, we're also providing vehicular uh, circulation on the west side between the existing tennis courts and the new building, and that's also maintaining the existing fire lane access. We're putting a point of, uh, of uh, controlled access at the north end um, so that, that it could also be used for access into parking towards the, uh, the solar shade structures. Um, to be operated as needed by the, the, the high school. So I'll just add to that. <laughs> so as, we, as we were as promised. Looking, I know. Right? <laughs> um, so as we were looking at combining all the parking and concentrating it to the solar area and the south lot, we really were um, challenged with needing some flow to, to for exiting purposes. Usually, yep. events people kind of trickle in. But when you leave an event, everybody wants to leave early or at the same time. And so what we're looking at as we're, look at, as we're considering reconfiguration of the south lot is also using, utilizing the fire lane as a secondary exit for parking of the solar area at special events that are highly attended. Mm -hmm. So it'll be somewhat controlled, and it is a fire lane, so we can't have people parking there and thinking they can just pull over for a little while that'll happen once and then the fire department will clear them. So um, we're, that'll be part of the project as we're looking at enhancing all of the other parking areas. So we are gonna preserve that and Sonia is pointing out to the north where those gates are, whether they end up at, right at that exact spot or they end up further behind the theater or closer to the pool, that's all you know can be determined, but this is a starting point. Can I make the point? Um, we're, we're looking tonight at the Estancia Theater proper, that, that location. There was already work planned to rethink the solar structures. Unrelated to this project, its overall cost, et cetera. 
So at some point we can show you the grand design, but this is about the theater and that location. Thank you. Um, so one of the, this also shows the western edge of the building, which was previously adjacent to the gymnasium. And so we have a few slides ahead to show what we've done for that elevation of the building, because that is one of the pieces that had to be uh, designed. Another slight change that we have made is we've relocated the, the loading into the sheet scene shop from the north to the western side. And that had to do with the elevations of the, the site itself. It made it actually on grade with the scene shop to make ease of access uh, from that uh, loading area into the scene shop, into the black box, all at the same level. In the previous version, that was an elevated condition. We were also actually able to maintain all of the main entry points into the building. The, let's see, I can use a pointer here. Um, the main entry into the lobby, the main student entry, and the north entry. And we'll take a look at those uh, in some of the, the upcoming slides. But given that there were very minor changes that needed to be made in the configuration of the building, uh, this is just kind of a recap of the major program elements, there wasn't that much that needed to be uh, altered aside from the location of the scene shop door we also added a, a door into the green room here off of this plaza which was an also an element that we had in our previous version uh, but the major components of the building are the 250 seat theater on the south black box theater on the north a lobby that wraps both of these elements a central core of restrooms and then along the western edge, along the blue, is the, a bar of support spaces mm -hmm. with dressing rooms, storage uh, for costume and, uh, and, scene, and props, and the scene shop to the north. So does it look familiar? <laughs> and then at the second level, this is really the technical area that's accessing the lighting galleries, the catwalks, and the control rooms. And this level hasn't changed at all. So here, uh, mm -hmm. there's going to be a series of uh, renderings of the exterior. And uh, I, I would just like to um, mention that these are meant for um, design intent, <laughs> and they're not fully photorealistic. So as we flip through, um, you might see some of the landscaping as being just plain glass, uh, grass, but there's really a level of detail that uh, of planting and, and then some of the materiality that I'll talk about may render a little bit different in each of the images. Um, but the two elements of the black box on the right and the theater on the left, those are of a high performance uh, cementitious panel with patterning and an integral color that harkens back to the brick color and the tile color in the existing building. So we're trying to uh, tie into that uh, connection. That material that you see on the exterior actually falls into the interior, uh, continues into the interior that's visible through the glass lobby wall. And so that was another way of trying to connect the interior and the exterior. Um, the exterior uh, is a, on the frontage is a storefront glazing wall that we've uh, patterned and broken up to create a rhythm uh, that goes along the Placentia Avenue. Uh, so it allows the building, the activity inside to be showcased but also provides some shading and a, uh, a little bit of um, um, shading inside of the lobby. So this is a view as we move down Placentia looking at the front entrance. Um, we really wanted to use the landscape to also tie the existing building along into the new building because we didn't want to make, we wanted to make sure that the theater still felt like it belonged on campus. 
And so what we, we initially did is we looked at the levels of the existing gymnasium and that entrance, the main student entrance mm -hmm. on the existing building. And it's all set at the same level as the, um, the lobby of the theater. And that way we were able to build a plaza area in between the two spaces and create a line of palm trees, a new line of palm trees into the, um, in between the buildings that leads back to the athletic fields. And it was all trying to create uh, a sense of welcoming and gathering and tying the, the, the campus together. Um, as the, the building is set up from the parking and the turnoff, we have a series of terraced landscaped elements that are, um, that kind of repeat the pattern of the rhythm of the, um, the storefront windows. And then we have access uh, that with uh, steps that lead up into the main entrance and a, um, a slightly raised sl sloped surface for access. And that happens at both the, this entrance and on the north side. And we also wanted to bring uh, the element to uh, the canopy in front of the entrance to really highlight that this is the main entrance and also to provide some shading in the lobby. So this is the north view. And you can see that it's slightly sloping with some steps that are coming off of this smaller plaza. This is the plaza that is accessed off of the, the lobby to the north and also the green room here. And then this is the doors to that main corridor coming off of the support spaces. And then we have some more landscaping along that edge to soften, soften that edge. And this is the south side that, uh, where the lined palm trees are leading back to the athletic fields. And so we felt that with this new positioning of the building that the student entrance really needed to be, to have a little bit more presence than before. So we also added another canopy and a uh, seating area to really engage more student activity there. And we did note that all of the seating areas and raised walls will have skateboarding guards um, because we know that that's a maintenance issue. And so here is a rendering of the interior of the theater, the 250 seat theater. It's a one level room with raked seating. And that's to optimize the sight lines for the patrons and also for the proper acoustics. And it's also designed acoustically to make sure that students are able to hear themselves and also be able to project their voices because it's very important as they're learning to um, really uh, embrace and develop their theatrical and music um, careers and education. Um, about two-thirds of the way up from the room, there's a low height wall that, sep that slightly <coughs> separates the room so that when there's a smaller audience, the room will feel more intimate. And then along the sides, there are side boxes with s removable seats, and that's allow uh, one to have some VIP seat seating, but then also allow for some additional space inside the theater for performance. And then the first row of seating is also removable so that musicians and performers can also engage further out into the room. And the uh, stage house has a modified uh, tower with rigging and line sets for scenery and performance events. Yes. And then uh, the surround surrounding the room that you'll see uh, in two levels are uh, lighting positions and catwalks. And, and actually above the uh, floating canopy, there are also lighting positions. And so those will bring you around to the control rooms at the second level and the follow spot up to the top level. And those will also, the at the second level, those will also provide areas for 
potential performance too. And this is a rendering of the black box. Um, and this can accommodate about up to 100 uh, seating area, um, but it can configure into multiple uh, positions and uh, configurations. So this is just one example. Um, above the uh, floor, there's a light pipe grid that will allow for flexible lighting positions and also for uh, uh, hanging points for scenery and audio visual equipment. Um, these uh, renderings were, are in uh, black and white at the moment as we are refining the, the color palette. And I believe that that was the last. <clears throat> yes, sure. So, so this is just an example of a summary of some of the discussions that we had when we had met with the drama department. Um, I'm going to go back a few. I won't take too much more time, though. Um, so one of the one of the requests or questions from the drama uh, program was specifically uh, one of the things that Sonia had mentioned in regards to having additional um, floor space for musicians to perform. And even though we know that with the removal of the first row of seats, we still aren't going to be able to get an orchestra pit concept out of that area. It's really just an opportunity to help support or have an opportunity to have some musicians down there. And some of those winged areas that we were talking about along here, they could be used for musicians, performers, guests. I mean, there's a mul multiple um, ways you can use that area. Um, the drama teacher also had some questions about the office for her and where her classroom would be. And so we've provided some opportunities for a dedicated classroom within the um, existing classroom buildings. And so there's five classrooms that Mike and the teacher have talked about, so we'll get that outfitted. But if the black box was to be used as a classroom space for a period of time, then we found an opportunity to provide an office for her. And so we looked at a storage space right off the black box, which is pretty typical of some of our other spaces, uh, black boxes throughout the district. So we are going to make improvements to that space so it can function as an office or a storage space, depending on what our end need ends up being. There was also another request on <laughs> the control room and whether or not in the theater the control room had direct access to the lobby for oversight of that area. It does not. As you can see in the um, interior rendering that we had of the theater, the, the way the topogra topography of the exterior of the building and the way that the theater slopes up you can't have a door at that level and it be, you know, um, adjacent to the lobby. So what we ha what we are doing is putting an in infrastructure so that if it became a need, we could have a camera in the lobby and we could have a, a screen in the control room. So mm -hmm. they would still have some visual visual monitoring ability, just not a door direct access. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things that we talked through. Um, the theater techs had much more technical questions and. We had the acoustics and the AV designers as well as the theater designer in that meeting. So they went through a lot of those things. I think the only thing that we added to the project uh, after, after discussing and going in detail with the theater techs were some additional locations where they can plug in mics for different types of performances, which wasn't a big deal to us. Uh, we also talked about the equipment and we'll work through the equipment needs what we are trying to do is make sure we stay state of the art and not necessarily exactly what we have at every other theater. Okay, Trustee Ursulu. Oh, did I? I don't think I pressed it, but I think your computer did it. Oh, but I'll wow. talk. <laughs> um, thank you. That was awesome. Um, 
I don't have any comments about the inside. I know nothing about theaters. That's not my area <laughs> of anything. Um, but the outside um, space where people congregate and people wait for things. I, I do have a lot of experience waiting for kids outside of things. Um, <laughs> so it does seem like there are some places people could be sitting here standing in shade area. But I am seeing like a lot of palm trees, which don't give shade. Um, I see two trees there that will grow and give shade. And so the awning will come out, right? So like if you are waiting, you could be standing in shade. Is that correct? And so, so I'll have Sonia go over that a little bit more. But one of the things that we're always really careful about when we show you renderings is we don't want to overemphasize something because when, when we do projects with trees especially, we may be planting in a much smaller tree. So when the project is done and you look at it, it may not appear that it is going, that it's what we showed you, right? If we show you a fully mature tree with a canopy that's 20 feet and we plant a 24 inch box of a tree that has little twigs when it starts off. So I'll let her talk about that, but that's something that we do try to be careful for. So it might be a little understated here. You can see canopies, but you really can't tell how much shade you're gonna get. There's just um, a little bit of shade being shown here. Awesome. Right, and those are things that we can I think that we can still massage as we look at. The idea behind the, the, the palm trees is that they would un unobstruct the view. Mm -hmm. uh, with having some uh, smaller uh, of the olive trees and the, the fruitless olive trees mm -hmm. and uh, some uh, Brisbane boxes around uh, here, around the, uh, the steps, and then along the student entry, uh, along this side of the building, and then... I think we have some, maybe a few more over here along the, the south side. But um, the idea is that by the entries where you might have some student seating that there also would be the canopies. But I think that we could, uh, we could continue to look at if there are areas that we feel that the students would congregate that we could mm -hmm. uh, study the shading and the shadows of the building. And, and just the, places like your, like yeah. those um, are concrete, right? Like are those little, like that little green rectangle, are those concrete, um, I don't know, planters or whatever? Retaining called? walls. Okay, so like someone, you know, an elderly grandma waiting to watch a show could lean on that, could sit on that. Like just places that people will naturally want to rest mm -hmm. and sit for a second. So those, they could sit on those, they're tall enough. Those are um, tall enough, uh, but I think that for safety, we would probably consider some benches. benches. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, student board member, Fernando? I just had to, to say uh, like a positive comment so far. So um, I think it's great that you guys are aiming to be like uh, shaping it to be more inclusive in the sense of adding more like seating outside for students to gather. Because I know uh, for a fact that like many of the students now they're hearing that there's gonna be a new theater. There, um, there's like some positives and then there's some negatives. As in, like, students are like, oh, if they're just gonna put another building there, like it's gonna be empty, you know. And to see that, and I hope that this will be available for the students at Estancia, um, um, in the future. That way they can get a better sense of how it's going to be because I feel like, uh, typically students are getting like a negative, um, idea of how it is and I'm in I just appreciate that you guys um are approaching towards more inclusivity um for the students. Yeah, so the expectation is is that this kind of carries the green belt as much as possible from the front senior lawn or the I think you call it the senior lawn. Um and carries it so we have, you know, this continuous um green element that just draws everybody to Hey, yeah, I had a, a question. This is this is great. It looks really wonderful. Um, I had a question about um, student traffic flow. As students exit the buildings, what are some of the paths that they have to go back to class? Given given that they have a limited passing period, uh, have have we considered the, the paths that so they can take? Can yeah, back. can you show us like a, a visual of? Because I, I know, I, I love the idea of uh, opening up the fire lane in order to that's, allow for not, the good. big events traffic flow for cars. So, so 
depending on what the teacher is doing that day, right? Who's in the building? But if they are in the theater itself or the black box on any given day, the doors, are they right here? To the cafeteria? Or is that gym? Yes. Oh, so so this is this is the entrance that has the storefront, and it's in between the gymnasium and the what will be the new student courtyard. Okay. So they can still come out the the commons right from the commons in between the gym and what would be the student courtyard adjacent to the locker rooms. They would still come out this location, and they would have to walk this distance to, if they're going in through what we're calling the, the back, back of house or student mm -hmm. entry, which is really where they would they would use more frequently. Right. The lobby is probably going to remain closed except for events, or it would be accessed from the interior rather than just having a lobby open for no, you know, no particular reason. And then depending on where the drama classroom ends up being on the existing campus, they may take a different route. I don't know if Mike's still here, if he wants to comment at all on the, um, the circulation, but, but we don't see it as a huge challenge. Okay. Uh, we know that, you know, even for like PE, there's a there's a changing period or there's mm -hmm. some period of time that we think that they're still going to be able to get up, get to the classroom or their teaching area. And then there's, there'll be some lighting for when they have they come out of practice uh, after dark uh, and they want to go back to their locker or something. Is there lighting involved? Yes, there's going to be sight lighting to make sure that there's the adequate uh, lighting for just passage, but also security. So safety. Yeah. Safety. Great. That hallway is very dark. <laughs> Which hallway? <laughs> the hallway where the star is. Well, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, on the inside. On the. It's going to need a lot of light. Oh, by the gymnasium. Yeah. That's how. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's being a little weird. So the the Here. the corridor from the commons. Inside or outside are you thinking? Inside. <laughs> right there. I mean, basically the part that's showing is all encased, and it's really dark at night. Okay. Well, we can look at the interior lighting and exterior. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I was wondering, since we have um, Principal Halt <laughs> here, um, I was just wondering if, um, kind of related to what Fernando was talking about, were the staff able to have um, any input into this besides the drama group? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking specifically about them asking questions about how wide the fire lane is for sports and for people going in and out. The, the um, when it came to the, uh, we've had the opportunity to work closely with the, uh, the, the current drama teacher and the former drama teacher. They've had the, the most input into the, um, you know, this, the development of this building. But as to your question, you know, when it comes to the, the circulation patterns of how we're going to be moving around the building, we've had uh, opportunities to have extended conversations with the athletic director, okay. uh, as well as uh, the, the head uh, coaches um, who uh, okay. are also teachers. So it'd be our football coach, uh, uh, baseball coach, getting their input for how we want to really take a look at making sure that people who are coming to an event uh, can attend the event, that they can travel safely, in a way that makes them feel good about participating uh, and as well as making them feel good about every aspect of our campus. Great, thank you. Um, and then I just was wondering um, about the kind of following up on that, um, the entrance, and I'm so glad you've been meeting with the city because I think that's really um, key. The, the entrance at times even now can get congested. So do you guys have a good plan? Like, are you gonna create maybe a different, a very designated right turn lane or? So the what would be the future or the expected entrance where all the parking will be? So we don't have a great plan yet. We have a, we have a proposed plan that we are working with our architect and the city. So that's why we went and did the walk recently. We had some feedback from them. We said we really needed to get some things in operation before we made a definitive plan. So we're going to continue to work with them, look at how uh, there was a request for a crossing guard. There was a request for, um, I had requested for a no right-hand turn on red light into the lot. And then we know since that, at least it's signalized, which is a good thing, um, to look at changing 
how the signal is operated, where the signal would be read, read in all directions during certain hours so that kids could cross in either direction and it would be a red light. So the city is amenable to that, but we have to do some traffic studies before anyone agrees to what the ultimate solution is. Okay. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, Fernando, yes. So kind of relating back to what Trustee Crane mentioned about like traffic issues, um, since uh, a lot of the parking spaces will be gone, um, how will that like impact the like future events? Like for, for example, I know graduation for seniors, it's typically like, like the parking lots are already full and crowded and seeing how there's gonna be fewer parking spaces. Um, would you guys be like open to having a sign? You know how in every like building, there's like a number of people, a number of how many people can occupy that building without being overcrowded or stuff like that. Maybe a sign that way people or drivers can know like, like oh, like there's a limit, you know? And so that way like, like uh, there's a fewer risk of like having crashes or like accidents happening. Yeah, we, we just really need to study what mm -hmm. we think the trends are gonna be and do some counts at events to understand what the car loads would be and then we can come up with some solutions. But yeah, we're really interested in developing some solutions, but we have to study what the new patterns are mm -hmm. and enable for those to be effective. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, next, do we have a legislative or budget items? I can give a little update. Um, there was on, January 23rd and then as well, I believe 24th and the week before that there was a budget perspectives workshop. Um, some of you may have been able to attend. Um, I appreciate Carol who got us the PowerPoint of the slides. Um, Fe February, not January, February 17th is the last day for bills to be submitted to the state legislature. So I'll have some more updates regarding uh, bills and things like that next time. This time the big news is the budget and just how that will affect uh, Newport Mesa. Um, the biggest things coming down are there'll be some changes, but we're um, community funded, so some of those won't impact us. However, one that will impact us, and I'm sure we'll hear about it um, from Jeff down the road, as we'll see how that works out, is that um, there's planning to be an 8.13% cost of living adjustment, which is really high compared to what we've had in previous years, and um, they're not exactly sure how they're going to fund that uh, and how we're going to fund that, so I'm sure we'll get more information or figure that out, uh, right, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, but the biggest thing is uh, with the ongoing support for certain programs, you know, we don't get funding for TK. The governor's committed that he's going to continue to fund a lot of programs related to education, again, where we don't apply to a lot of those programs like TK because we are uh, basic aid community funded district. Um, but Universal Meals is a program that will continue and we get some benefit from that. And then there's the um, discretionary block grant, which we will need to understand how we use. The uh, total amount of that was just reduced um, statewide. So that will affect the amount that we get. And then additionally, a good 80% of that needs to be um, to fund uh, labor and staff. So um, if you're a parent and want to know how that's going to affect your individual school site, uh, it's going to be more about uh, how the district's able to utilize uh, labor and staff. And I, I know at PTA, I get a lot of the questions regarding uh, art masters and things like that. This grant doesn't really go towards that for the most part. 20% of it would, but that would be something that you'd want to work with your principal to, and um, the district to understand how you could fund that if that's something that is of interest and um, is a need at your school site. Um, and then that is pretty much what I had for now. I don't have anything to add. A lot of it gets into the to the really specific weeds that are, again, not really related to what our district would have to come up with to answer um, questions. And um, I think I have one other thing on arts. No, I already covered the arts thing I was going to say. All right, thank you. Uh, Trustee Murphy, did you want to add anything? You're good. No, okay. she, Michelle covered it. Okay. All right, um, we will move to item 21, consent calendar. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay. 
a second. second? Moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursorlu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Okay. Um, next up is discussion action calendar. Approved schedule of board <coughs> meetings July 2023 to June 2024. So moved. I approve, I approve the schedule of the board meetings. Um, let me, oh wait, yeah. For July 2023 through June 2024. A second? I'll second. Great. Did anybody have any comments? Any dates that don't work? Check the high holidays. We're fine. We're good. <laughs> okay. Thank you for checking the holidays. <laughs> All right. Are we good to go on this then? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. Roll call vote. Student board member Fernando Barignon. Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursorlu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay. Next up, su uh, Superintendent, formal reports. Just wanted to start with um, a, a measure of gratitude. I had a chance to attend um, a symposium with about 700 superintendents in California and hear their stories. And I'm just grateful for our governance team. I'm thankful for the team that we have doing the work throughout the district for our parents and our allies and for our students. This is a great place to be. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this great work. I, I had a chance to go see most of our high schools and, and several of our CTE programs and just saw some amazing students doing amazing work. When you talk about college and career ready, uh, I saw students who are gonna be prepared, well prepared for um, very, very good careers. We were able to see the multimedia communications department and see them interacting um, and, and thinking of ways to communicate using technology that are just next level. Uh, the Medical Careers and Health Services is w one of the programs we've highlighted before, but but seeing those students and what they were working on, and I was pre-med for four years in college, they were they were killing it. It was great, killing it in a good way, not a bad way, just so we all understand <laughs> the vernacular. Um, uh, the sports medicine, they were talking about steroids, and oh, that we had that kind of program in school back in the 70s and 80s, we would have uh, a difference in some of our uh, MLB records. And then the culinary arts program, which we know has won national awards, saw those students performing, and um, one of the students I was watching had these amazing knife skills. I said, wow, that's so amazing. You know, how many years has it taken you in this program to get there doing garlic and some other things? And he said, that's my first semester. And I'm like, wow, that is a good program that can teach a student like that in that short amount of time. Similarly, I went to Costa Mesa Middle and High School and saw the Career Exhibit Day. Once again, saw our students being exposed to some of these really amazing opportunities they have as they think about how education ties to their future and their careers. They even had a STEAM center that was going to be outdoors and they were flying drones, right? But it was a windy day, so they didn't want to take that risk. So they set up a net system inside of the library at Costa Mesa High and flew drones in there and the students were absolutely engaged and intrigued by that STEAM opportunity. I also want to um, thank our, our, our team and Leona and her staff and our labor leaders. Um, we participated in the Labor Management Initiative um, intentionally. Uh, we want to be intentional about taking relationships that are very, very, very good and making them even better. And we want to be clear that, that our efforts to build labor management alliances um, it's not about negotiations, as we pointed out. It's not about taking the rights away from our 
labor allies. In fact, it's about building the relationships that better protect their rights and better meets their needs. That's what we do in these meetings. And I just wanted to say that when we had this vision uh, 13 years ago to launch this program when I was at the state level, one of the things we said was that it had to be labor management together with a member of the school board. And so President Anderson was there. And I just think that and seeing it in practice is absolutely the right way to do this work. So it really is governance, it's labor, it's management, it's powerful. And as the consultant that was here with, with us, actually the CEO of the company, said to me, he said, Wes, you are in a special place. So um, I absolutely agree. Wanted to also throw a shout out to the professional development that we're doing in the district around our safety initiatives. Um, the other day, I tried to pull into the park and uh, parking lot rather in park, there were no spots. So I had to find a different lot and walk to the district, which is fine, I can use the steps. And I asked, what are we doing today? And it was a threat assessment training. So we had staff members from all over the district. We even had our um, community allies, law enforcement and others in the room, learning about how do we make threat assessments in the classroom, on our facilities, um, how are students behaving so that we can intervene before unfortunate things happen. And I thought that was a powerful demonstration of us walking the talk, if you will, and not just talking about safety, but being about safety. And then finally, um, it's with great sadness that, that I share that one of our former colleagues, uh, Tim Holcomb, passed away unexpectedly last week. And I, I didn't have um, a lot of time working with Tim, but I sat with uh, some people today who did. So they were able to really kind of inform my, my thoughts tonight. And they said they appreciated his heart, that it was bigger than the room, and they appreciated his moral compass. Um, and then they shared that his daughters, his two daughters, uh, consider him their hero. And I think that's a life well lived when our kids consider us their heroes. And so I just wanted to share that. We've shared it with staff, but wanted to share it with the community. Um, and that, that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with you, Trustee Craig. Sure. Um, let's see. Um, East Bluff Elementary um, sponsored an MLK Junior Day of Service, and they 150 uh, families and friends went to the OC Food Bank, and they uh, packed l uh, almost 1,000 boxes to be delivered to families in need. And that was pretty amazing seeing our little elementary school kids already understanding what civic engagement and days of service means and giving back to their communities. So, and they did that on a, a day off. So that was amazing. Uh, back Bay Monta Vista, I had the pleasure of being present in a room to uh, witness the Student Recognition Award ceremony um, last week. And it was standing room only. Dennis Ashendorf was rolling chairs from the office to have <laughs> parents sit down. There were six, at least six rows deep of parents that were there to recognize in recognition and to basically support their children that were receiving awards. And for some, that was probably the first time that they were ever in the same room accepting an award where a parent and a and a student is 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 present. It was absolutely amazing to see the support and just looking at the parents' faces and the pride in their, in their you know, demeanor and comportment. So that was really wonderful. Uh, CDM went to 12th night, uh, such, such talent everywhere. So went to some other plays like Aladdin. Um, I'm sure um, Trustee Murphy will mention that later. Uh, sports, academics, just uh, amazing to see our, our kids just finding their passion, following a pathway, being recognized, feeling worthy. Um, it's a village. I also did some pro professional development myself, always growing. Six hours, <laughs> six hours uh, of professional development, development, including the budget perspectives workshop with, that I attended with Assistant Superintendent Trader. That was very revealing about you know, what is coming up as far as you know, the fiscal landscape in our in our um, state and also a four-hour webinar on the brown act with trustee anderson and trustee wygand which was actually very enlightening it went by pretty
pretty quickly. We learned a lot. Very inspired by the time we were done with the webinar. So um, it is Board Appreciation Month, so I appreciate all you board members, my <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> you do the hard work, and I appreciate that. That's what makes us a team. Uh, Superintendent Smith mentioned how um, he appreciates that we work well together because we don't forget who is our North Star, which is the kids. And Stu, I would love to go on a, a ride along. Is he there? Okay, the whole AIDS program, that sounds so great because when we came on board um, the class of 2020, we did not, we were in the midst of COVID, so we never really got to do any ride alongs and all the fun stuff like riding on a school bus and all that. So can you please, Eleanor, let Stu know that <laughs> we were interested, sign me up. And lastly, welcome um, Keith Carmona to our, our team. Thank you very much. Trustee Whiteburn. All right, so I, um, in the past couple weeks, I attended um, the Exchange Club of Newport Beach, um, hosted a meeting, um, and it was with, it was all about fentanyl awareness, and they had the uh, Orange County Sheriffs there, and um, it was, it was a really great presentation, just like the one that he has presented to the Harbor Council PTA as well. So we're getting everyone in the community um, to be there and to listen about fentanyl awareness and how to take action. Um, it was great because there were um, just, there was some health associates of private schools that were there that hadn't had the training yet. And, you know, it was great to say we had had the training <laughs> in our schools and our nurses. So, um, but it's a, it, it was, it was a very interesting, and I'm, I'm grateful that they, what they do for our students there at the exchange club and that they involved us. Um, and then I went to the Costa Mesa city liaison meeting, um, with, um, trustee Murphy and, and trustee Anderson. And we learned, um, a lot. It was a good, um, meeting to discuss a lot of things about, um, e-bike safety, um, other kinds of initiatives that they're doing, um, that don't necessarily involve the school district like, uh, waste, even though that does, um, and, uh, transportation, um, just through the streets. So, um, great meeting, great, um, camaraderie there. Um, and then since it was Board Appreciation Month, uh, the Killybrook um, hosted uh, some board members for a luncheon, and that was great that they were there. We got to learn um, a lot about what they do in their early intervention programs um, and then meet some amazing kids that are using some of the um, uh, talk assistant um, programs that were on our agenda today. So it was great to see them. Um, well, it's been a very rewarding couple months um, for me. Um, it was, I was very um, excited to get on the campuses, like Wes was saying, and see all the amazing new programs and pathways our kids can take. Um, the Newport Harbor Culinary class was one of my favorites as well. Um, it's been a joy going into the PTA meetings, the foundation meetings, and seeing how many dedicated parents we have, making our schools um, even better than they are. Um, I want to thank Leona for heading up at Newport Coast. We're looking for a new principal, and she is there making sure that our parents um, give their input. Um, she had a night for them to come and has told me that there are lots of also online, you know, the option to get these parents to um, give their feedback online as well, um, I think is going to be very helpful. So thank you for spending the time and, and involving our parents. Um, the fun stuff, of course, the, all, the, all the athletic programs at the high schools have just been so much fun to be at. And I'm, the, the spirit, the school spirit is still is there. It's definitely there. And I think everybody's excited after COVID to be back in the gyms and, and rooting for their teams. Um, the plays that I've been to, um, CDM and Anderson, Shrek, they were Broadway productions. Um, amazing and amazing at these theaters. I mean, we had to do them in the elementary schools when my kids were there to be at these high school theaters um, and get to have the lighting and the, <laughs> be able to hear the kids. It was amazing. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's just been fantastic. This morning I was at the Dogathon for Harbor View and... Um, Doc, Mr. Del, Del Real, I wanted to speak with him, the principal there, but he ran the entire time I was there. An hour, and I think I was there for an hour and a half, and he ran the entire time. And to walk on a campus and see a principal doing that is 
it's wow. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, the principles that I've been able to witness, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to be on the board. You're right. I haven't seen a principal oh, room the whole time. time. Whole time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Trustee Pearson, could you mention the uh, foundation? Oh, yes. Newport Mesa Schools Foundation um, teacher grants. Uh, the grant, the applications are due by February 10th and apply for teachers. Um, that's great. Probably the best news uh, came um, Monday night uh, from Principal Kwong from um, Costa Mesa, where he announced that uh, the Costa Mesa High School Cheerleaders won CIF State again for the second year. So big shout out to Corey and her team over at Costa Mesa and um, the girls. I'm sure we're going to bring them all in for certificates and everything. So that'll be exciting. Uh, two years in a row. Um, as Dr. Kwong said, this is uh, a, a great testament to all the hard work of the families and the coaches and, and all the work of the parents that they put into to make sure that those girls are so successful. Um, I also had a great time at uh, Radium Girls at Costa Mesa. I don't know if you, if any of you got to see it, but Isabella Mills, who's one of our student uh, board members, was the lead in the play, and she was amazing. She was beautiful. She was heartbreaking. Um, it's a it's a heavy story if anyone has not seen it, um, and she pulled it off with such you know, grace and talent for someone so young. And it was actually, it was a great production. So uh, kudos to the drama team at Costa Mesa. They're doing a phenomenal job. Um, same thing, some good meetings at Polarino PTA. Uh, they're doing great. Um, we got a chance to visit early college high school with Dr. Martinez. That was wonderful to hear um, how well those students are going, uh, how their coursework is going at uh, early college high school and how, um, as I've mentioned a few times, the statement that Dr. Martinez said it is the social emotional learning that they put into the kids and the development that they help them achieve um, was instrumental in getting their kids through the pandemic successfully. And I just really thought that was so such a profound statement and, uh, and um, really a testament to all of our work in this area and everything that, that um, our assistant superintendents and our counselors and our teacher's aides and, um, and all of our staff that we bring in to, to help support our students. It really, it, it means a lot. And to hear him say that he really thinks that his students were successful just, you know, mostly because of that work that we put in initially was just very gratifying. Um, even though I didn't have anything to do with it because I wasn't here, but um, it was great to hear. Um, also, Costa Mesa High School Foundation, um, we gave out some grants to our teachers as well. Um, we're getting a new uh, French horn who knew they were so expensive, but we are getting a new one at Costa Mesa <laughs> High School, um, which was great to, it was great to hear the requests coming in from the teachers about all the interesting and fun projects that they're trying to do with their kids. So um, again, always gratifying to hear how much hard work our teachers put into our kids every day. Um, I also had a ton of fun at the College Park Chinese uh, New Year festivities. It was amazing. Um, it was a beautiful morning, and um, and and it was kind of rainy. It had rained, but the sun was shining, and so everything was sparkly, and it was just, it was fantastic. Um, so they did a great job. The whole community came out. You know, it's going to be a good event when you can't find any parking anywhere, uh -huh. and um, so that's definitely the case at College Park. It was wonderful to see all the families there watching and enjoying and um, celebrating the Chinese New Year. So um, that was great, and yep, the city meeting went well. I do have a compost bucket. In in the back seat of my car. Uh, I haven't yet uh, told my family that we need to start putting all of our food scraps in this bucket yet. Right now it's just hitting my kids in the back seat as it rolls around. <laughs> gonna have to do something about that <laughs> when I asked how are you gonna enforce that I know I was like I don't know right that was good um and then obviously the e-bike uh uh situation um you know was discussed and how um I've been we're gonna hopefully get a flyer out to all the PTAs and start communicating more with all the parents about um rules of the road with your e-bike 
So um, look for more information on that. That's it. Great. I don't have too much. Um, I'm excited uh, that there's that uh, mural at T Winkle <laughs> that you just told me to say. Um, <laughs> to Trustee Anderson and um, and Trustee Murphy were there as well. Um, so there's a really beautiful Be Kind mural, thanks to United Way and their private partnerships um, in the community and. Um, Anyone free this weekend, Beauty and the Beast is at California Elementary. So anyone have free time, go see that. Um, also, Trustee Crane and I were able to stop at Back Bay and um, participate in dance class. So that was basically oh, yeah. like flash dance. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that was a good time. <laughs> and um, I also was at a first five uh, commission meeting and they were sharing some best practices from other districts about how they're using their EDI data and making um, much needed updates to their wellness policies in other districts. So I think there's some good models for us to um, kind of copycat a little bit and start those discussions on our, our wellness policy and kind of revamping that um, post-COVID. I think obesity prevention kind of lost its wind during COVID. Or we had bigger fish to fry at the moment, but now we have uh, two and a half years of kids being more inactive um, and stuck at home. So we have to kind of recoup that. So I'm excited to, to work on that with folks. Thank you. I was at a lot of the, these things with a lot of you. Um, but in addition, uh, this is CTE month, and it's just a month to highlight career technical education. As uh, Superintendent Smith mentioned, we did go tour uh, CTE programs at three of our sites. It's always great to see. I think there's culinary is very well known, and um, the health, science, health and the digital media arts at Estancia are very well known. Um, I didn't know as much about the pathways that we have at Costa Mesa High School, so that was nice to see what the Careers with Children um, pathway is a new or pathway, and I happened to mention it to um, a parent of someone who's got a student at Costa Mesa Middle School, and they were really excited because they hadn't heard of it yet, but that was an interest for their student who was going to be going to high school next year. Um, I also enjoyed going to the College Park uh, Lunar New Year, they did a cultural activities um, afternoon with third through sixth grade, and um, it was just really wonderful to he watch all the students communicate with each other. And I was not able to understand anything that was going on, and that's really great though, because it was it was it wasn't like halfway speaking, you know, Mandarin. They were fully speaking um, on specific things, so it's great. You know, we worked so hard on that program. Um, uh, Newport Heights. Elementary did their play Frozen Junior at the high school, um, and that was really fun to attend. Um, and then Ensign is doing their very first play in a long time, uh, Dear Edwina. They haven't been able to put together a play, so they're very excited. That's this weekend, so if you have time, um, it's a it's kind of a quirky, cute little story. Um, then finally, our Community Alliance for Bike Safety had a really quick meeting, um, but I'd love to talk with you guys about what you learned at the Costa Mesa and that meeting because um, so many of the wonderful programs that um, Newport Harbor and CDM have rolled out, people have kind of um, been inspired and rolled out their own things. And we found that through sharing what all the other organizations are doing in the same room has really resulted in um, the best kind of mm -hmm. contagion, <laughs> the, the mm -hmm. social contagion of being concerned about bike safety and um, ways that they can bring those programs back. So I feel like the more we talk about it and share what we're doing, um, those will start to work, you know, in our neighborhoods, which so many of, if you're going from Newport Harbor or to Ensign, you're, you know, Costa Mesa's right there. Um, and that, Oh, and then just, just a big thank you to Kelly Brook for the amazing luncheon and the wonderful artwork that the students um, made. They made us little pictures that said, best school board member ever. Um, and when my kids are not being nice to me, I just hold up the sign to remind them. <laughs> um, and that's it. Thank you. Yes, and I, I also wanted to mention that the CDM PTA community is very hard at work to us um, working on the CDM home tour, which is scheduled for March 7th. Um, if interested, uh, please go, go to their website and purchase a ticket. It uh, basically is the only fundraiser from the PTA that, that, um, that they do all year, and it goes to some incredible programs for kids. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the items that was on our consent calendar was for Susan Fish, and I just want to take a moment to um, thank her for all of her work with Newport Mesa for 27 years as she retires. So thank you so much.
and um, I was able to do several site visits, which was my plan for January. Um, I was able to go to Harborview um, with Lisa and um, Ray with uh, Trustee Weigand and CDM high, Middle School and High School and Whittier and T. Winkle and Wilson and College Park. And it has just been so amazing to see the general, like I've never done that many at one time. <laughs> so I was like, stack them all. Um, and I, the overall perspective and morale is so much different than it was last year. And it was just amazing to see, A, everyone's smiling faces, um, but just the difference walking into every single classroom. There were kids that were jumping up and down and singing in Mandarin at College Park um, and kids that were learning about the gold rush at Whittier. And it was, it was just like a lovely experience. So um, I'm excited for the um, upcoming months because everyone, I feel like teachers and staff and students, everyone's just excited to be together. Um, at the city liaison meeting, one of the other things that um, the city and the district is working on our open space, so possibly open, opening up some of the playgrounds um, to have more access for some of our neighborhoods that don't have parks. So I'm very excited to hear it's, it's in dialogue right now. Um, and then on Thursday uh, at Estancia High School, we're having a CTE um, walkthrough, so I'm really excited. I haven't seen one of the programs, so that will be wonderful. Um, we are going to be doing a board governance workshop coming up here soon, um, which I know I really always wanted an onboarding session, and we are going to have one for our two new people. Um, and so I'm really excited just about that time together. And then lastly, I went to an LCAP webinar um, that was hosted by California's Together. Um, and one of the things that really struck me was just the way that they've reoriented big pieces of their LCAP to be extremely community centered um, and the community were the ones that informed the process um, so much more than I think some a lot of the ways that we've done it in the past so I would love to know I would love to see more of that community involvement um, and that is it <coughs> all right it is 839 meeting is adjourned <laughs>